standard talks about Seattle um, Energy Code 2030 challenge. Uh, the next thing is the Living Building Challenge. So the Living Building Challenge is a net zero. It's independent from the grid, uh, self-sustaining. Um, basically, this is this is a project that, in the downturn, uh, when we had a lot of time on our hands, um, <laughs> we entered this competition. Um, there's a couple of different competitions, and actually uh, got first place in. This is a theoretical project uh, called EcoLab, and uh, I tried to research up on it. I actually didn't have an opportunity to work on it, but um, I can you know, go through some basics. Um, essentially, let's see here. So this is, you know, this is what it looks like from the sky. The idea is that it's it's a it's a vertical farm. It's something that you live in. It's something that you farm in. And it's something that becomes a social gathering area for people. And so, um, in this section, this you know shows pretty well um, a couple of the different elements that, that went into this project. Um, so the uh, essentially the well, along the windows is where we've got uh, a lot of the, the farming on the on the one side, and that's you know the the south, southwest facing faces. So they're going to get the most sun and can naturally grow vegetables, tomatoes, lettuce, all that kind of stuff. Um, so not only is that a benefit that we can utilize the sun almost like a greenhouse to generate these plants and vegetables, uh, it also actually the plants will help to cool the area a little bit. Um, and, and what happens is, so here's, in terms of how the, the air works, uh, there's these heat tunnels here in the, in the very front. I'll show them. Basically, we've got natural air coming in through these tubes underneath and up into the spaces. And just like the donut, through, through the heat being on this one side, it's drawing that natural ventilation out. So the natural air is coming out and going up and up and out of the facility. Yeah, I guess you could. Yeah, something similar to that. Uh, this is, I guess this is the venting that we're going to this down so you can see this. So you can see this. So is it that step? No, that was. Yeah. See there? Yeah. Okay. Right. Uh, there we go. There we go. Okay. So that so this is the earth too, and this is essentially the air is coming up, hitting all the units, and then this is where we're doing the farming, and that air that air is coming through, and then through uh, it's going up through an exhaust vent. Um, we figured out the trajectory of the sun, and that starts to. That starts to determine where we're locating different elements uh, in terms of vegetables. Uh, they're also on top of, you know, natural sun. We dump it kind of here, as you can see today. Um, we're actually also using hydroponics to increase the count of uh, vegetables uh, and produce. And what what we've done is is study study the, you know, the amount of units that we could fit into this building and the amount of uh, produce that you could grow just with, you know, natural sunlight wouldn't be enough to sustain everybody. And so you actually have to add that additional hydroponics to really up and increase the amount of output of the produce. Um, let's see. I'll just some of this. Uh, there's rainwater collection. Um, basically, we've got a, a rainwater collector here at the top. It comes down, and we use it for gray water for our toilets. Uh, there's also, and that basically comes down. We can treat that water from our toilets, and then use it for our plantings. That's out here on the face of the building. So the water, so this treated water, uh, we, we recycle back in, and then 
Um, we've also got you know, gray water cisterns. Things like gray water. This is a this is a great great time. And and the whole the whole idea is that um, we've got a lot of paved spaces these days, and a lot of buildings that take up big footprints. And so where does all that water go? You know, it's it's coming down, it's hitting streets, it's hitting top of buildings, and we're really uh, killing or overflowing our storm systems. And uh, I live I, I live up on Queen Anne, Third Avenue Hill, and essentially the water when it rains will actually get a quarter of an inch of rain, and, and I've heard that they actually have storm water sewage overflows into into the which is insane. So, yeah. so again, you're using natural uh, convection for your ventilation. Right. Yeah. And with the with the plant growth you have in there, is that I'm not sure if you're using CO2 sensors in there or not. But if you are, would that kind of counterbalance the uh, uh, CO2 in the in the spaces? Um, good question. Um, I'm not sure. And and unfortunately, like I said, I wasn't able to work on this. I think, I think what, uh, just, you know, in terms of how, you know, thinking of a greenhouse, it seems like we have issues with um, overheating and um, humidity issues. And I think that basically with, um, you know, the way that this air is coming through and the, and the air traveling up, it's actually circulating it. And so the idea is that that condensation doesn't, so the floor grates are the right. Yeah. Yeah, so you constantly get that yourself. Um what else? Um let's see, natural ventilation, properly designed sun shading. Um, you know, figuring out the sun angle is huge. Um, and then, you know, there's the, along this side of the building we have a large concrete wall. And one of the the benefits of having the concrete wall on the on this side of the building is is similar to like in the southwest where they actually have got uh, adobe or um, high mass high density walls the heat will hit the walls and in the night uh, it will actually keep the house warm because the sun's been hitting that mass all day and then the night will actually cool the walls so during the day the interior is actually cool so that's the concept behind having, you know, a large concrete mass on the back is that you start to retain some of that heat and the so, um, And then there's, you know, uh, on top of this is, uh, you know, the social aspects of it. Um, the Equal Laboratory provides meals, um, potentially for homeless. Um, the gray water is essentially employed into bathing facilities or, you know, like toilets. Um, the, the hydroponics, there's a training center for residents to help them learn how to do um, You know, longer term housing, co -mingles. So it's just, it, it's basically a kind of a city within itself, basically. Yeah. How many residents is that designed for? I don't know. Okay. Um, on the roof there, is that photovoltaic systems I'm looking at? It is, yeah. So we've got photovoltaics up here <laughs> along with wind, um, with wind capturing. So this is, it's, so we've got wind caught up here with the turbine, PV, and then the idea is that it goes down to a battery, and then the battery basically starts to charge all of the power to each of the units. And then, you know, hypothetically, you'll be getting really good natural sunlight. Yeah. Um, was that relying on any kind of uh, uh, natural gas or any kind of other inputs? Because it sounds like it's a, what you, a self-sustaining engine. Right, yeah. A perpetual engine. Yeah, it's a, a living building, basically. You know. isn't, there, isn't there a name for, like, uh, when the sun comes in and then there's like a wall and then it's like something, something wall. I can't remember what it is now, but uh, um, something Maybe French. Yeah, like it's a like a trombe wall. A trombe wall. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. 
Um, on your methane conversion to hydrogen, or do you have an anaerobic digester in the, in the underground here? I think that the, yeah, I think so. And, and what, one thing I should, um, and I'll send, I'll send uh, Brian some notes, but essentially this can be found on our uh, Weber Thompson website. And, here, and there's some really good information about this. Um, it's been talked a lot about, and actually developers have been calling the office actually talking about potentially developing something like it. Yeah. I'm just wondering, so um, <coughs> you have almost no mechanical systems in a building like this. Right, exactly. Okay, that's what it's living. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Is this, uh, is it the uh, connected to the, like the, would it be connected to a city water grid so you get fresh water in, or does it supply its own? I think that you would probably have to. I think that that's one thing that, you know, during the summertime when you don't get enough rain, um, Seattle is a unique, unique area that where we do get a lot of rain, and that's a blessing in disguise sometimes. Um, so, uh, I, but I can see wanting, you know, fresh water to, as opposed to, you know, you're gonna run out of fresh But you had a, a lake nearby you could suck from? <laughs> yeah. 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 And is this connected to the passive house um, work on passive house? It's design? not. It's not. But uh, it's very similar. The, the ideas are very similar. Yeah. The passive house. I don't know. Did anybody? That's, that's the one, one net zero. Yeah. So I don't know if anybody visited that. It was up in Greenwood. <coughs> uh, there's a, a gentleman. You had. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. There's a gentleman that actually has, through all of his own money, never basically built this house and I mean basically it's heated with uh, the, the equivalent of a, a hair dryer being turned on for like five minutes or something. It's, what? it's pretty amazing. Super so insulated house. Somebody but the walls, but then you're tiny enough. But then you need to think about, you know, your walls at that point are so thick that you know you start eating into your livable area, it starts to become more expensive with materials. So there's a really break get a good shaker and thick walls, they don't hold up so long and start shaking. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah. Say it again, Tim. Oh, earthquakes. Thick walls? Right. Um, earthquakes. So, the next... Does anybody else have a question? Yeah. yeah, are there any living buildings being constructed? I remember hearing something a few months ago about There's one of the foundations. Of the, the Bullet Foundation. Yeah, the Bullet Foundation up on Capitol Hill. Um, Shukart is the contractor on the project. Um, it is the, I think, the first living building uh, in, I don't know, in the city or even in the nation. Um, I know there's one other somewhere. Is there, okay. And we had some plans, but shot that. We're doing a living building out on this here. For, okay. Uh, to to the wetlands kind of thing, our past present. And at that time, that was about four years ago, there was one other living building in the nation, but that was yeah. it, it'll be, it's gonna be pretty exciting to, it's, yeah. it's really setting the bar uh, for everybody else. And um, I guess um, there actually, there's another project that's being constructed now in uh, South Lake or North Lake Union, uh, right next to the transfer station. And um, that is being designed by Alan Mann. And the idea there is the Bullet Foundation is an extremely expensive building because it's one of the first of its kind. And all the materials and all the education that's going into working with contractors, working with consultants, uh, it's huge. So there's a big learning curve. But you know, once that building sets the bar, it's going to be a lot easier for buildings to go. So this project is being designed and actually is going to be design and review in North, I guess, Wallingford. Uh, it's right next to the transfer station, and you know, they're talking about using some of the um, carbon, or some of the methane from the from the transfer station, which is really, I mean, what a good idea. And it's going to be, and, and, the, and, the, and it's going to be half the price, basically, per square foot that the building foundation is. Can you bring up a point about the earthquake? A lot of these buildings we're talking about, are they putting the earthquake? Earthquake proofing in there too. And yeah. Basically, how are they figuring? Because you figure there'd be loss between joints and stuff like that where you've got 
So I mean, under. Are you going to prompt that stuff too? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's um, and that's that's a building code thing. It's it's been built for every project. So no matter what, any project that's being designed right now in Washington or in you know this zone, um, you're required to the size. Surprise with built sustain. Uh, with big design. So I'll just I'll just wrap up. Um, okay, so then there's I guess the last one is net positive, where you're actually giving back to uh, giving back to these utilities. Um, I don't have an example of that, but um, maybe there is one. I just didn't have time to record. <laughs> um, but so all right. So why um, so why is energy code and and lead uh, important for architecture? So in the city of Seattle, um, basically almost every apartment building that we're designing is a lead, lead apartment building. And there's a number of reasons for that. Uh, one of them is uh, there's a, something through the city of Seattle called Priority Green. And Priority Green basically gives you a pass, not a pass, but a, a pass to move faster through the permitting process. So the plans reviewers that are reviewing the permit documents actually are are going and looking at your documents before they're looking at somebody else's that is not going to be really interesting concept. Yeah. Um, um, it, it does it does shave time. Um, but it's getting to the point where a lot of people are and, and there's and there's another reason for doing the lead, and um, you know that it's just it's purely marketability. Um, apartment uh, the people that are leasing apartments are saying we're lead gold, lead green, you know, lead silver. Um, your utilities are going to be cheaper. Um, it's going to be a healthier space to live in. Um, and then you know there's apartments, but then there's also class A office spaces. And I mean, a great example is, you know, our our office, our office building. Um, even when we went from 100 people down to 25 or 30, you know, we had the we were on three floors of that office building in 2009. It's a downturn, and immediately rented it back up, 100% rent the entire time. It's it's been. So that's that's a really big thing for developers is they're able to say this is class A office building that is indeed sustainable building. Um, and then they're also they're finding that through studies that there's a low turnover rate for people that are renting uh, or leasing spaces. They they once they're in it, they they, they have to have it. So um, and then ultimately, you know, it's it's just good for our health. Um, and it helps sustain our planet, which is pretty important. Yeah. Um, how does the city? Uh, I don't have this exactly. How does the city handle buildings that might be lead as far as construction goes, but then the people who live there or work there turn off some of the things that are supposed to be part of lead? They still consider it compliant or sort of in some weird gray area. That's a gray area. I mean, supposedly you're supposed to, you know, a lot of the things are integrated into the building, but I, I see what you're saying, that when you're going through the permit process, you can say that this is going to be a lead project. Right. And then you get through to VE, value engineering, where the owner says that's too expensive and you start cutting stuff. Um, and you could say, okay, we can't do it. So that's a good question. I don't know. Um, I, But there's, um, you know, in terms of that, there's a good balance. I was sitting in a meeting with our current owner on this project, and um, we were going through our lead checklist of all the things that we were going to do. And basically, the owner was saying, "Okay, we are going for lead silver, and we need, you know, X points. We need 35 points, and we currently are showing that we have 45 points. Okay, so." have a surplus of points, where can I take something out and make money back 
and still make that lead silver. So basically, they'll go from you know their surplus of 10 points down to five. You always want to make a buffer, but basically say, okay, well, all right, do I really need this? Do I really need this? So there's really some there's an interesting balance of cost for lead and and getting. Those are the those are the realities. <laughs> so this is all this is all uh, driven by cash, by by the corporations and stuff, but business and stuff like that. Um, what about just community? That want to buy in? People get into community housing projects and stuff like that. Most people would say maybe the leaders, you know, they're not going to have any clue what you're talking about. So the sales guys talking. About. So right. is there any um, groups out there that you tie into that just not a person? Oh yeah, yeah. There's, there's a lot. Um, Cascadia, Cascadia is, um, they actually, they're on the, they are the organization basically that owns and owns the lead. So they have all the checklists on their website. They have all of the um, information how to, so you've got a checklist, how do I, um, what do I need to do specifically to meet these certain so all that information is on their uh, the Cascadia website. You can produce that. And, and all these things that I talked about, like the 20 word challenge, all those things are things that you can look at. When you're doing the retrofits, do you try to get the customers to go up to the lead levels or? Good question. Yes, so city, <coughs> Washington code, city of Seattle code, you are required to still meet the code if you are retrofitted. Whatever the new codes are, you have to meet. Exactly. Are you finding that building owners are fairly receptive to these new technologies, or they're like, ah, it costs money, I don't want to spend money ever for anything? Right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it depends. Um, you know, you've got, you've got good developers, you've got mediocre ones, and you've got the, the guys that just want to um, and, and what's interesting is, is you find that the people that uh, want to construct the building, do it well, and hold on to it, mm -hmm. those are the developers that you want to work for. Because those are the developers that are willing to put the extra money forward to make sure the building lasts longer and, you know, you know is energy conscious. All, you know, Based on performance is designed. Exactly. Yeah. Whereas, You've got your low end developer, I want to name um, That literally all they're doing right now, and we talked about this just a second ago, is, is right now there's so many apartments being built. Um, it's insane. And, and when is there going to be a surplus? And these developers are literally developing a project as fast as they can and then zone. So they'll develop the project. And what's insane, I'm going to give you a number and you're going to be I was amazed. Um, so, project I worked on with Queen Anne was $13 million to construct. So, that includes land, architecture fees, construction. $13 million. Developer turned around and sold it four years later. And this is actually he's a good developer. He, he just you know, posed my name. But turned around and sold it for $26 million in four years. I'd say there's a pretty good problem. So a lot of developers are doing they're just developing these projects and they could care let you know, they don't want to sit in on meetings, they just want to have the project designed, built, great, I can use the priority green, fast track through the city, and let's get that thing built because then I can sell it to the Deutsche Bank. So that's your base weights of the product on their side. What's that going? I was going to say, so basically they're ordering these buildings as a product to sell to somebody else. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, it's like, that might Um, you know, you say, you say 50 years, I guess. So the lead ones and the ones are basically good price I can have to sell it to the I can get out. I mean, that's kind of a It's an interesting world. You learn a lot. Yeah. What's that new ordinance for cities? City of Seattle or maybe the old 
prior for the you know energy efficiency reporting that they have to do mm -hmm. just till every year? How's that how's that impacting you know, in terms of retrofit buildings or architects getting involved in that? What's it involved what's involved in that? So so I don't know too much about the what I'm anticipating is that it's similar to the, the CBEX survey, where they're, they're going around determining uh, the industry standard. And actually, I did just talk to somebody about this, and, and they don't know what they're doing with the information yet, which is kind of very interesting. But they're they're basically they're they're getting all this information, and um, I think there's there's ways to use it, but I don't know the that, that's a requirement now for all all building owners, right? And that they can be penalized if they don't report annually. As I understand, um, I could be. I'm not, I'm not positive. Mm -hmm. It could be. I could. I mean, CBAX is, is three to five years. I think they, they do their submit. So mm -hmm. annually, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a. I, I'd be. Yeah, well, that, that ordinance that just went into effect last last fall. Last fall. Okay. Yeah. How do you spell CBAC? It's um CBAC is C B E C S. And that's commercial building energy consumption rate survey. Okay. Anything else? Job question. What's that? <laughs> Job type question. Sure, yeah. The architectural firms, not just yours, but whoever comes, but uh, the rest of them around the area. What are they looking for in people like us? Because all of us are in the, basically in the ETSB program. What kind of people are they looking for? Are they looking for people that are also architects, or are they just looking for people to that have the knowledge of how to re retrofit or set up the high back systems on, the HVAC systems on? New buildings, retrofitting buildings. Sure, sure. So, um, so what I'd say uh, the platform that you guys are moving forward with, it seems like, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it's more geared towards systems and and designing energy models and stuff like that. Right. Seeing some head shaking. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. All right. Um, so, so those jobs are going to be in extremely high demand for us, um, because of the energy code. And the energy code changing every year is forcing architects, because years ago, architects could just, they could do the prescriptive, they could do the component you know, review in-house, and they could fill out the little sheet. They could say, OK, I've got R13 insulation here. And we've got this insulation at the roof. Great, I'm getting it done gone in those days. The days now are you have to have a building model. The building model is basically telling you where you need to insulate your building, what type of windows to use, um, you know, what type of materials. And, and I mean, there is a direct relationship between the architect's progress in how they're you know, designing and how, how they're Information and the model impacts that design because the walls start to get thicker. And so. so, in other words, the architectural design of the building could possibly change during either a retrofit or a new construction. Right. In other words, if you only allow, say, two foot for ventilation systems, all that, exactly. and all of a sudden, hey, you're going down to my space, so I got to raise, do this to the whole building or whatever. Exactly. So you have a building that's designed for 50 years, by realistically you're in there every five to 10 years doing demo and then redesign for TI. So every time you go and do that, you have to go back through the architect, you have to go back through these guys, the systems, to figure out what you're going to do with your values and all that kind of jazz again. That's a good question. I think so. Depends on the extent of the old. Yeah, I think, that's, I think that's a good idea. I mean, if you're just doing interior remodels, yeah, I mean, it's, I think it's exterior walls where it's touching the building. Right. But interior stuff, Good job. Yeah, that probably would not be right. I mean, if you're replacing windows and stuff like that, that's a little stuff. 
Yeah. It is a quick question. It, the students here are going to be getting to, into internships. Sure. And I wonder if you can just in general tell us any professional organizations where they might want to network. Um, on the spot, no, but I can send you a okay. lot of information. Okay, great. Um, we work with uh, Rushing, uh, they're a consultant that we use a lot. Uh, they're an MEP consultant. Um, <clears throat> Nathan Hale is the gentleman that I've been working with on our energy code stuff, and he's, the guy's always, he, he knows that thing left and right. So, um, Rushing is good. Uh, Patrick Hayes is an engineer, now he's kind of a separate person. Um, but I'd say rushing is a good person. And I'll talk to him if you just have a question. I appreciate it, thank you. Yeah. Uh, at your firm and, and maybe some of the other architectural firms around, um, do you guys still generate physical models and who is responsible for that in the firm? Good question. Um, we, it depends, it depends on the firm, it depends on the size of the project. Typically, what we'll do is actually um, build a 3D model in, in, uh, on a and, and the reason for that is uh, you can use the model from the very beginning, where we, you, know, you have to go through the design review process with the city. Um, you've got an initial meeting, which is an EDG, where they just want to see passing. And then the follow meeting is a recommendation meeting to the design review board. And you can basically start with this model, which is massing, and then take it to the next level, which then you show for your design. You're constantly altering it. You right. um, they still do make um, hand models, or, um, but there's a, um, a lighting, a lot of lighting consultants will actually build interior models. And, um, there's actually a really, really good program through the University of Washington. Um, where they have a lighting um, studio, basically, a lighting laboratory, where they do all kinds of studies on uh, natural lighting and uh, how it affects spaces and size of spaces and stuff like that. But I would absolutely um, recommend anybody to get out there and talk to companies, uh, MEP companies. Uh, even even just an informational interview is huge because you get your name out there and people see that you're interested. Um, when the economy was crap, I uh, was working part-time for probably two years, which kind of sucks. Um, I did a lot of fishing <laughs> and housework. Um, but um, I, I actually did utilize my time efficiently because I went and talked to know four or five different architecture firms and they were receptive they were it was I went to MBBJ which is a really well-known large architecture firm and talked to the head principal and he gave me an hour of his time it was phenomenal and and what he basically taught me or talked to me about was you know well so I, I'd highly recommend it anyway even if you can't get a regular just to do the information because you'll learn a lot too else how did you approach yeah to request that interview what was talk about it as an informational interview or you yeah yeah I mean um, everybody knows somebody that knows somebody um, that's a good way to go about it I uh, just saw how my wife knew about you. Um, and then you know being in the arch architecture industry tend to know people are you guys using LinkedIn at all for that for those kinds of connections I personally am not. I, you know, I've, I've seen it used. Different people use it. I, I personally am more of a go out and shake your hands. But I mean, even just cold call, that's how I got my first job. I got out of college and I started calling architecture firms. <laughs> Doesn't work for everybody. <laughs> Let's thank John for his great informational interview president. Yeah. Well thank you for all your questions. They were actually really good questions. And I'll I'll try and get you guys some more information.
And I did post notes on the, um, I was just taking notes here on the presentation up on our LinkedIn site for the um, Career Speaker Series. So if you're not a member of that yet, um, please do. Uh, you need to be on LinkedIn. Um, which, if you're not a member of that, help you do that. But then just do a search in the groups for Cascadia Community College and you'll see the Career Speaker Series as one of the groups. Just send a, a, a request to join and we'll get you linked up to that. That'll also get you emails about uh, coming out that Re uh, Rebecca's putting out about the upcoming speakers. So you'll be on that list if you're about your speakers. Right. Another thing that I'd like to extend to you guys if, if you're interested as a group um, is to come to our office and have a tour. Um, we, we give, uh, the University of Idaho was in last week, uh, we've had people from Sweden, Japan, Germany, all, kind of, all over the world they come and uh, we get tours, so if you're interested, why don't you just, okay, just learn now. I just thought, uh, as you notice, I'm sitting in a scooter, sure. did a, did a walk around the place. Sure. Are most of your buildings when you have the design, do you have to follow some of the some of, or all of the ADA standards? Yes, absolutely. So in other words, if I came to your building, I should be capable of going to any space in there. Absolutely. Except like a little tiny storeroom, of course, but I mean yep. in any office areas, everything like that. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so we have pizza. Um, again, thank you to the Next Generation IT Club for uh, sponsoring that. We'll, we'll do the pizza out in the hallway here, and uh, you have a chance to come up and ask John last question.